Hi, um, my name is Alexis Butler. I'm a GP and the GP liaison physician at Peter Mac. And I'd just like to thank you all for coming tonight and um, thank our specialist speakers from Peter Mac, our collaborators, Northwest Melbourne PHN, and Associate Professor Caroline Owen from the Education Department at Peter Mac for organising and being involved in this event. This is the first of a series of cancer education events, which will be webinars and face to face. Um, and this will be a special series for primary care that Peter Mac will uh, use to help educate on cancer management and screening and diagnosis. Um, but next slide, please. Next slide. Before I begin, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, the Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network and Peter Mac would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. Next. Also got to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, all attendees are muted. Um, please put your questions as you think of them in the Q&A box, um, not the chat box, and we will address them at the end of the presentations. Um, the session is being recorded, but the questions will be asked anonymously. Next slide, please. Um, Please ensure you have joined the session using the same name as your event registration or phone number if you've dialed in. Northwest Melbourne PHN uses Zoom's participant list to mark attendance and certificates and CPG will not be issued if we cannot confirm your attendance. If you are not sure if your name matches, please send a chat message to uh, Northwest Melbourne PHN Education to identify yourself next. Next, thanks. Just. Quickly, I'd just like to mention Parkville Connect, um, which is a secure web-based portal providing you with access to patient information in the Parkville electronic medical records. So basically the medical records of Peter Mac, the Royal Melbourne, the Royal Women's, and also the Royal Children's. It doesn't replace your usual correspondence via discharge summaries, and of course the patients do have to provide consent. But it does mean that you can have access to most of the clinical information on their hospital records, including things like laboratory and imaging results. And if you're interested in this, please go to the website at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker and host for the rest of the evening, Professor David Speakman, OAM. David is a long-standing and highly respected CMO of Peter Mac. He has decided recently to step down from this role in 2023 to concentrate on his clinical and advisory duties. Um, he has over 20 years experience as a surgeon specialising in breast disease, skin and melanoma. Thank you, David. Thanks very much, Alexis, and um, welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to be joining you. This is a, a bra actually in Nice in France. Um, never been able to afford uh, to get one of, one of these for my wife or loved ones, but Always a good way to start a talk at seven o'clock to attract a bit of attention. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to talk tonight, hopefully, about uh, breast, uh, benign breast disease, which is very important because it's clearly much more common than breast cancer, although the media may uh, give you a different perspective. The problem, of course, is it can often be difficult to differentiate from breast cancer. And so, as most of you will know, most women will walk in with either a lump pain or something happening along with their nipple. And we'll talk about the various things that can cause that um, tonight. Next slide, please. So you may remember back from your undergraduate days that most benign breast conditions 
uh, can really be categorized as aberrations of what's normally going on in the breast, that it is an active organ that changes throughout life in response to cyclical estrogen change, particularly premenopausally, and can lead to all those conditions listed on the slide. And you'll see that of all those things in age under 55, cancer's not leaping out of the top of the list because all the things on this page are far more common. Uh, next, please. So just want to highlight that the use of triple assessment, so in particular, clinical history and examination remains the bedrock of diagnosing breast lumps and breast problems. We, of course, use imaging and the, the bedrock of that is still mammograms and ultrasound, but we'll talk about some more uh, advanced techniques shortly. And of course, in terms of pathology, we use uh, FNA, in fact, less and less. That may be changing. And we also use core biopsy. And I think if you click the slide again, that will appear. Um, so next slide, please. Just important to remember that. And Wanda's going to talk to you shortly about family history and breast cancer or, or genetic risk. But I think it's important if you're out in general practice to have a clear cut understanding of actual risk, not the media rhetoric about one in nine, which is great if you want to get people through the doors of breast screen. But actually, if a 50-year-old walks into your clinic, her risk of developing breast cancer in the next 10 years is actually only one in 40. And of course, if it's a 20-year-old, it's only one in 2,000. But, but the level of anxiety in women around this stuff is often considerably higher, and their understanding or impression of their risk is often much, uh, much greater than this. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to run through a few things that I see every day that I'm sure a lot of you see all the time, and hopefully give you some basic information about them and clear up some myths. So breast cysts in particular are common. They mostly occur in women over 35, but certainly in the mid in the 40s and early 50s. They're rare in women under 30. It's estimated that about 10% of women will present with a palpable cyst, but ultrasound will show impalpable cysts in many more. In fact, that figure of 20% is probably way too low now as the technology of ultrasound has improved over the years. So has the detection of simple cysts down to one or two millimeters in size. Often you'll see on reports that they can't characterize the cyst. They'll use words like complex or complicated cysts, which will be terribly confusing. Lots of radiology practices will suggest biopsies ad infinitum. And I think one of the things we want to talk about tonight shortly is whether those whether that much uh, testing is indeed necessary. So if you look back at um, the ideology of breast cysts, the exact cause is unknown. As we said, they're really a, a normal part of the physiological change in the best in the breast. They're certainly related to estrogen. And in women who do use HRT in their postmenopausal years, you will still find cysts as a common cause of breast lumps. I think there's a myth that cysts uh, turn into cancer. I would put to you that's very uh, incorrect and confusing. I think what happens is that sometimes on imaging, things that are actually cancer are confused with cysts rather than there being a significant association or indeed that cysts turn into cancer. So I think you can reliably inform your patients that if they have breast cysts, the, any increase in the risk of breast cancer is quite minimal and certainly nothing that can be um, actioned by either yourselves or the patient. Um, next, please. Uh, so I mentioned that the triple testing and I mentioned the history and examination was still vital. Cysts will often uh, to the patient appear suddenly even seemingly overnight, they'll almost uh, invariably be in that scenario, be tender or painful. And sometimes they can be visible depending on the position they are in the breast. When any of these things happen, please do the normal thing and work the lump up, but you can reasonably reassure the lady that it might be assist with that type of history. 
rather than tell, tell them to make a mad uh, drive out from somewhere like Daniloquin to a place like Peter Mac to get checked out uh, because you think it's a breast cancer when in two seconds in the clinic we put a needle in and tell them it's a cyst. Uh, next slide, please. So I said there's been some improvements in imaging. These are sort of contemporaneous pictures of what you might see for a cyst on the right-hand sides of mammogram with, in fact, three. You can see three. There's one with the yellow arrow. You'll see another two below it. And if you keep looking carefully, you'll find lots of small cysts, actually, the longer you stare at the picture. The ultrasound on the left side is a beautiful uh, demonstration of a classic cyst, jet black fluid inside hyperechoic with a good true transmission behind it. So that's basically what it looks brighter behind the cyst or deep to it. So there's no shadow um, and you can even see uh, versions of a halo sign on cysts these days. So here's a couple of different things that you'll see. A picture on the left is a hematoma. Sometimes you will see this will be called a cyst, uh, all that material on the left-hand side of the actual lesion. If you jump up and down, that's uh, precipitated out uh, red blood cells. It'll turn into a snowstorm if the patient jumps on down while they're under the ultrasound machine. And on the right, there's a picture of an abscess. Uh, this is actually non-lactational. Uh, we're not going to cover that too much. Just various types of things that might be might be the cause of complex breast cysts on a uh, ultrasound report from your local radiology place. Next, please. Uh, this is an oil cyst, classic result of previous trauma to the breast. You can see on the mammogram on the left that um, spiculated area uh, with a nice sort of eggshell layer of calcium around the outside of it. And then thank you for pointing that out. And then on the right is the, that what that looks like under ultrasound. You can see all those layers of uh, echo bouncing back those straight lines through the through the the uh, oil cyst. That's because of the layer of calcium on the front of it. Uh, so good if you should if you ever get a chance to ask your breast surgeon how much breast ultrasound physics they've done. It's a good question to ask. Uh, next, please. Here's something else that's a bit infuriating. You can see the mammogram on the left. There's a little lesion. Uh, if you've got a good imaging team, they will put a, a skin marker on that, which is the little white dot beneath, uh, just beneath the lump. And then on the right hand side is an ultrasound. This is just a sebaceous cyst in the breast, in, sorry, in the skin of the breast. Doesn't require anything more than reassurance. Certainly doesn't need a needle biopsy or anything like that. Yet I frequently see people being sent along with for that type of problem. It's really overkill. Um, next, please. So. When I started uh, in breast surgery many years ago uh, in the UK, they were still cutting out every cyst that they saw and junior medical staff would be doing that on the lists on the local anaesthetic down in the back room of the clinic. Utterly ridiculous. So we've moved from excising cysts to aspirating them and sending the fluid off for cytology. And now we don't even bother to do that unless there are particular uh, warning signs because the fluid will invariably show nothing atypical and certainly nothing malignant. And you can see an aspiration on the on the right there. Next slide, please. So this is the type of stuff that I aspirate from cysts every day. Uh, it runs from the clear fluid you can see there to much darker olive turbid type stuff that's quite thick and viscous. Really, the difference in color and the nature of the cyst is largely down to the ratio, ratio of sodium and potassium in the cyst. And it's of no practical value to know that. As I said, cytology is not useful, in fact, useless, uh, unless it's blood stained. I think the last thing to mention is if you do aspirate a cyst yourself, which is of course fine, please always check to make sure there's no residual mass, both uh, for your benefit, because that's something that should needs further imaging and further workup, uh, but also to so the patient is aware that the lump itself that you were aspirating is completely gone. Next slide, please. So if women who walk into your clinic with a palpable cyst, uh, about 50% will only ever present with one. About a third will have multiple cysts. Uh, sorry, about a third will have two to five, and uh, a small number will have multiple cysts. Some of these women will get recurrent cysts in exactly the same spot. I'd say that is an indication to go see a breast surgeon to be, just to be checked probably still benign and physiologic, but maybe a red flag that 
that women should have more careful evaluation with imaging, et cetera. Next, please. So fibroadenomas, we're just going to talk quickly about uh, they arise from a whole lobule of the breast, usually uh, in premenopausal women. About 10% of all of women will get a palpable fibroadenoma at some point, and of those, one in six will be multiple. This next slide, please. Um, just putting this up to highlight that although these fibroadenomas mostly occur in sort of uh, late teens to early 30s, it is possible to get fibroadenomas um, in later life. I think that was, a, it's a myth that you never get a fibroadenoma when you're postmenopausal. And indeed, in the screening program, actually about 10% of solid masses that are identified are found to be fibroadenomas. Uh, this is in postmenopausal women, whether they've been there for some time or are new. Next, please. Um, so most fibroadenomas will, in fact, either get smaller if you follow them up after six months or two years. Most will get smaller or disappear. About half will stay the same size. And only about 5% or less will increase in size. And I think it should be clear that we would only go and remove fibroadenomas that had particular, particularly abnormal features on their imaging or if they increased in size on serial follow-up. And usually serial follow-up for me means one scan six months after the initial diagnosis. Here's some old style pictures of fibroadenoma up on the top uh, right. Mammogram is a nice circle there where the arrow is. And there's an old picture of an ultrasound, terribly grainy and happy. Next, please. These days we get far better pictures. This, uh, this lesion is only four by nine millimeters uh, on a, a current sort of high tech scanner. We can do all sorts of things. You can see it's nicely round and doesn't have any vascularity in it. And we could safely do a finite aspirin on that if it's benign, follow that patient up in six months. And if the lesion is the same or has disappeared, discharge them from any routine follow-up. Next, please. Uh, that's just what a core biopsy looks like when you take it out. Next, please. This slide is what happens when a core biopsy goes wrong. And I've said that our radiological colleagues often recommend biopsies a lot. They don't usually tell you what can happen but to the patient on the other end of a needle biopsy for benign masses. The lady on the right clearly has a large hematoma after a stereotactic guided core biopsy. And the lady on the left actually has skin necrosis because the uh, clinician involved dipped the specimen that we just saw off the core biopsy into the formula and reused the needle through the same hole into the patient, thereby leaving, leaving formalin all over her breast uh, and indeed making make a track to the lesion. And so that eventually had to get cut out because that type of its tissue destruction uh, will not heal. So just a timely reminder that we do need to be careful that we're ordering the right test on the right people for the right reason at the right time. Next slide, please. Uh, nipple discharge. So we could slip through these uh, because really nipple discharge is uncommon if it's not blood stained and uh, not from a single duct. Don't worry about it. If it is, send it along to a surgeon. But even in those patients in women over 60 with a blood stained discharge from a single duct, only 10% of patients of those patients will have cancer. So whilst uh, it's all in our heads that nipple discharge is a big worry. By, and by the numbers, it's actually a very low uh, symptom as a presentation for breast cancer. Next, please. Or could you just slip through the next few slides? On um, This is all there. If you want to read further about nipple discharge and what it might be and what you might do about it, please have a look at the slides. You can just keep going through the purple ones. Main message, most nipple discharge is physiologic. Next, please. Keep going. That's all good. Uh, I just did want to highlight breast pain because every time I talk to GPs, I am reminded that it's the commonest thing that walks uh, in through the door, and a lot of women have it. It is rarely, rarely, rarely a symptom of breast cancer. Usually, it is either musculoskeletal in nature if you're postmenopausal, or hormonal or cyclical in nature if you are premenopausal. Uh, next, please. Um, as said, a lot of it is cyclical and will, will resolve at menopause. 
Uh, unless you're on HRT, you won't be getting much in the way of breast pain that is not uh, musculoskeletal origin originating from the chest wall, either from uh, pec major tears or small strains in pec major or, cost or various elements of costochondritis. Um, most, a lot of women, their symptoms will disappear spontaneously. That's why you know, some treatments work. It's often unilateral and we should warn our patients that um, it may become bilateral. It's quite common to start on one side and then appear on the other side and often radiates um, into the nipple and down the arms. Next, please. Um, one minute to go, David. No problems. Um, so most people can be reassured with a good history and examination. Uh, really changes in lifestyle don't do much. And, and other than getting a well-fritting bra, there's not much to do in that respect, other than to dispose the myth that uh, underwire bras do not cause breast pain and nor are they an issue in terms of breast cancer. Next, please. Uh, you can jump over that too. Really, uh, I think what you want to know is that you can try evening primrose oil for most ladies because it's full of gamma, gamma linoleic acid and it has no downside. The other drugs there have been used at various times to treat breast pain. My usual practice for resistant breast pain that's um, cyclical or hormonal in nature is to use a low dose of tamoxifen, so five or 10 milligrams for about six weeks. And I've yet to see that uh, fail anyone in, a, in spectacular fashion. Next, please. Uh, you can just keep going. Uh, thank you. We mentioned Tamoxifen. I just wanted to give you a quick look at what contemporary breast practice is looking like these days. Here's a lady with a tumour just near uh, her nipple on the medial side. Uh, in days gone by, she might have lost that nipple, but in this case, it's been preserved. As you can see on the bottom picture, only 62 grams of breast removed. And we're not going to talk about oncoplastics, but that's the specimen labelled up the top going off to the pathologist so we know exactly what's going on. And a specimen x-ray of, of that lump. You can see we don't really need to go for a massive margin. We want no ink on tumour. So as long as we have a few millimetres clearance around a breast cancer these days, we'll be very happy. Next, please. Uh, that's a specimen x-ray of a patient. And that is just a bit of oncoplastics. So I might stop there. Uh, I was going to mention that ultrasound has got better and better, as you've seen. Uh, you'll see lots of your breast surgeons using that in their rooms, but uh, it will never replace a full-blown diagnostic ultrasound by a radiologist or in a radiology practice, but it's great to, for example, diagnose and aspirate cysts quickly and more, much more efficiently for the patient. Next, please. Um, next, please. Uh, so we, it looks all pretty simple, ultrasound. Anyone can do it. That, that lesion there, a lot of people would describe as a complex cyst. Actually, it's an angiosarcoma. David might speak to you about that a bit later. Uh, primary angiosarcoma of the breast. Next, please. We're not, and next again, we're not going to talk about MRI other than to just go on to the next slide, I hope. One more. One. This is the one. So just to mention that the indications for rebatable breast MRI have expanded greatly. They're all listed there. And I think that's a great boon for the workup of women with various uh, breast abnormalities, but I think largely that unless the fitting the family history indications up there in green, I think that um, ordering breast MRs is not really the, a great thing for GPs to do because they find many more benign lesions than Sorry. malignant and cause more trouble. Thanks very much. And I better now introduce Wanda so you can take my slides down, I'll zip through them. Um, <laughs> Very pleased to introduce Wanda Kui. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Just got to get to the Wanda's slides. <laughs> so Wanda's a medical oncologist uh, at Peter Mac. She's rejoined us from the Royal Marsden where she spent a bit of time doing a PhD and becoming more expert in, in part of the various uh, familial aspects of breast cancer, uh, along with breast cancer and pregnancy. Very pleased to uh, introduce her and recommend her as an excellent medical oncologist if you need any help in that regard. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Um, next slide, Caroline. So today I'll be talking about breast cancer risk assessment and management in general practice. Um, we know that the breast cancer incidence has steadily increased over the past decades in Australia. Um, and certainly many parts of the world, and is a leading cause of cancer-related disease burden. 
And as David mentioned earlier, um, whilst one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, that's not a static figure. And certainly that risk increases over time um, and with age. And um, we know that part of this is actually owing to increased diagnosis as a result of breast screening programs where we're detecting um, more earlier cancers. But also this may be due to a failure of breast cancer prevention strategy. Next slide. We know that most of the increase in, in incidence in Australia particularly is due to an increase in hormone receptor positive phenotype. And this is largely driven by increased exposure to reproductive and lifestyle risk factors, which have, are potentially avoidable. Um, importantly, this is the subgroup of breast cancer for which we also have effective risk reducing medications. Next slide. I'm showing here the breast cancer risk factors, which can be broadly classified into modifiable and non-modifiable. So the non-modifiable risk factors, such as a pathogenic um, germline mutation in a high or moderate risk cancer gene, is actually quite uncommon, as you can see here on the left-hand side of this graph. Whereas modifiable risk factors, such as use of exogenous hormones, high mammographic density, postmenopausal obesity, alcohol use, inadequate physical activity, as well as um, short duration breastfeeding are actually quite common and you can see them on the right. Next slide. Uh, oh, sorry, you're gonna have to click a few. Thanks, Carolyn. So we know that over 5% of Australian women are at increased risk of breast cancer, as we can see here by the Cancer Australia definitions. So for women assessed to be at less than 1.5 times the population risk, which we can see here on the left-hand side of this slide, population screening is appropriate. So mammograms every two years from age 50, but you can actually access them from age 40. For the 4% of women assessed to be at moderately increased risk of breast cancer, intensified screening plus or minus risk reducing medications is appropriate. And for the 1% of women classified at higher risk, which are the women that I often see in our breast um, a risk reduction, uh, so risk re, um, management clinic at Peter Mac, these are the women who need intensified screening, possibly risk reducing medication and consideration of risk reducing bilateral mastectomy. Really our role um, as health professionals is to identify with the women who are at increased risk and offer them intensified screening and evidence-based prevention to try and reduce cancer incidence. Next slide. The real challenge is how do we do this systematically? Because the first step to identifying these women is actually doing their risk assessment systematically. And I guess parallels could be potentially drawn um, to primary prevention of cardiovascular disease and assessment in primary practice. This is a study that was conducted by some of my colleagues, um, which assessed the current practices and needs for primary care clinicians regarding assessment and management of breast cancer risk through focus group discussions. And what they found was that while many viewed assessment and management of cardiovascular risk as an intrinsic and expected part of um, the role of a GP, assessment of breast cancer risk was not routine and was generally patient driven rather than clinician driven. This was, you know, all, this, this study also found that there was a bit of a sense of doom, I guess, or a sense that breast cancer couldn't be prevented. And one of the major barriers to um, breast cancer prevention within primary care was that there was a lack of evidence based usable online tools. Next slide. And certainly this is something that we also face in the risk management clinic. Um, there are a number of risk assessment tools currently um, in use in the literature, but many of those tools have interfaces that are really difficult for women as well as clinicians to use. And few link risk assessment um, information to risk management advice. And there's some good qualitative research that has shown that women only really want to know their personal breast cancer risk if it's coupled with information about what to do about it. Next slide. And this led to the development of iPrevent, which is an Australian design and validated free online tool, which was designed for collaborative use between patients and their clinicians um, for both GPs as well as specialist clinicians to use. 
This tool estimates a woman's 10 year risk, which is really important when you're counselling her about um, immediate strategies, but also their lifetime breast cancer risk as well. And it's tailored to estimate the absolute risks and benefits of each risk management option as well. Next slide. Um, this tool can be found at the, on the Peter Mac website, and this is what it looks like when you click on the, um, on the link. Next slide. Um, it gives you some instructions about what populations this tool does not work in. So it's not designed for use in men, women who currently have breast cancer, have had a history of breast cancer, women under the age of 18 or over the age of 70, who have a personal or family history of a germline mutation other than BRCA1 or BRCA2, who've had previous chest radiotherapy, and who have half relatives with breast, ovarian and pancreatic cancer, as it does um, affect their risk scores. Next slide. This tool takes into account breast cancer risk factors such as age, hormonal factors, lifestyle factors, personal history, such as um, uh, you know, history of atypical hyperplasia, for example, um, as well as family history and presence of a known breast cancer gene, such as BRCA1 or BRCA2. And using that, it then chooses the most appropriate risk assessment model, either IVUS or Bodicea, the main risk assessment tools that we use in practice currently. Next slide. It then takes all that information and gives you some information about the risk for that woman and um, options to reduce her breast cancer risk. Next slide. This is what it looks like in terms of telling you what your risk is. Um, so on the left, you can see the risk of the woman assessed and on the right, it gives um, you an idea of what the risk of the total population is for comparison. Next slide. It also gives some information about treatment, uh, so prevention options um, to try and reduce the risk of breast cancer. Next slide. And these include both lifestyle measures um, and, next slide, um, screening as well. Um, and potentially, uh, uh, but it doesn't give, um, it doesn't give uh, advice about risk reducing medications. That's something for the clinician to do. Next slide. We know that one of the challenges with using risk assessment tools is they can be quite tedious and can be difficult to navigate and use. Um, so after iPrevent was, um, was launched, a survey of clinicians and patients was performed to see how usable this tool was. And you can see that this survey showed the usability of this tool was above average for about two thirds of clinicians and two thirds of patients, which is shown here. Next slide. So now you've identified that the woman in front of you um, is at increased risk of breast cancer. The question is, what next? Um, and I guess intens uh, intensified screening is one thing that we do recommend for um, women who are at increased risk. One of the challenges is that the sensitivity of mammogram can be lower for women with high breast density. And we know that screening with MRI in combination with mammogram has been shown um, to significantly increase sensitivity for women with high risk of breast cancer based on her family history or based on, um, on her germline genetics. This difference is especially pronounced in women aged 50 or younger um, in, um, in a number of studies. So the addition of um, mammogram, uh, MRI to mammography, however, does decrease the specificity. As David mentioned earlier, we do pick up a lot of false positives on, on um, MRI because of the sensitivity. And there are certainly more recalls. Um, we know that recalls can increase the cost of screening and they certainly do increase anxiety in the short term. But fortunately, qualitative studies have shown that there's little impact on long-term psychological health. Um, as David's already put on his slide, here are the MBS um, billing criteria um, for breast MRI. And actually, as of November 1st this year, the um, age limit has increased from, 60 to, so from 50 to 60. Um, so we can access yearly MRIs for women considered at high risk of developing breast cancer. Next slide. We know that 
risk reducing medication is also an important prevention option. Screening identifies cancers earlier but doesn't prevent them from happening, whereas risk reducing medications could potentially prevent breast cancer. Um, it's important for women who are at high risk, who do not wish to undergo or wish to postpone um, risk reducing mastectomy, but also for women at moderate risk who are not um, considered appropriate for surgery. The medications that we have um, are the two selective estrogen receptor modulators, tamoxifen and raloxifen, as well as the two aromatase inhibitors, exemestane and anastrozole. All are taken daily for five years orally, and the efficacy has been shown in multiple randomized controlled trials, um, which show about a 33 to 60% relative risk reduction. However, they only really work for estrogen receptor positive breast cancers and not for estrogen receptor negative breast cancers. Next slide. However, despite these proven benefits, we know the, the uptake of these risk-reducing medications that in women who are at increased risk is quite low, about 16% from international studies. And so um, a local study looking at why this is the case um, using surveys was conducted. And we found the main barrier for women was that fear of side effects, as well as inadequate information about these medications. Next slide. This survey also surveyed GPs, and what um, it found was that for GPs, the main barriers to prescribing these medications was lack of knowledge, um, followed by lack of confidence in providing advice about these tablets, as well as difficulty identifying who is suitable. Next slide. There are some um, tools that are helpful for this. So on iPrevent, there are some um, there is some information um, a, a, and tips on how to prescribe these risk reducing medications. So this, this is an example for tamoxifen. Next slide. And um, the Clinical um, Oncology Society of Australia also has some really useful information sheets for both patients as well as clinicians. Next slide. For women who do experience difficult side effects with tamoxifen at 20 milligrams, one tactic could be to modify the dose. And certainly there are randomised trials that show a lower dose of tamoxifen for a shorter period of time, so 5 milligrams daily for three years, um, did reduce um, risk of breast cancer events um, by 52% compared to placebo. So whilst this trial doesn't have the long-term follow-up that we have for 20 milligrams, it is a potential feasible option for women who don't tolerate tamoxifen. Next slide. So in conclusion, we know that breast cancer incidence is increasing. There are a number of modifiable risk factors that could be addressed at a population level, such as inadequate activity, um, obesity, alcohol use, as well as short, -term dura uh, short duration breastfeeding. But we also need to be moving towards personalised prevention, which really starts with systematic personalised risk assessment. Um, and what does the future hold for breast cancer? Well, the future is that perhaps with primary care and oncology partnership, that we could see um, improved breast cancer prevention and a potentially a downwards trajectory of breast cancer incidence in the coming decades. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wanda. Uh, wonderfully kept the time and uh, very informative, I'm sure. Uh, please look up iPrevent. It's an excellent uh, program for women and very well done if they do it with their GP. Uh, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Associate Professor David Giorgi, who is a surgeon here at Peter Mac uh, for a long time. We um, trained here as a registrar and then went off to get skilled up in melanoma and sarcoma over in the United States and has come back with a wealth of information. And I think uh, soft tissue sarcoma is always something I think scares all sorts of people and what to do when you see a lump. Uh, David's going to tell us all about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just, just before David starts, um, I think there's been a problem with getting questions into the Q&A box. So if you could actually put them in the chat box, if you can't get it in the Q&A box. Sorry, David. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, David, for that introduction. And uh, uh, Caroline, if you can progress my slides, that's great. So basically, I've titled this talk 
along the lines of what David just suggested, should I be worried about this lump? When, as a GP, should you think about a sarcoma? Uh, because soft tissue lumps are common and sarcomas are not. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, keep going. Um, so I'll cover this, uh, the topics of uh, what is sarcoma and importantly, what are the red flags to think about when a patient presents with a lump and when you should think about referring a patient to a specialist center. Um, okay, next slide. So soft tissue sarcoma refers to a large group of diseases uh, that affect uh, various uh, tissues of mesenchymal origin. So whereas most cancers arise in epithelial origin, if you think about it, these are tissue, most cancers arise in tissues that interact with the environment, you know, the skin, ducts of the breast, the ducts of, uh, sorry, the uh, bronchi of the lung, the bowel, soft tissue sarcomas arise in all the rest of the tissues, muscles, fat, nerves. Um, and so as I'll show you, there's now about a hundred different types of soft tissue sarcoma. That's been the biggest advance really in the last 20 years, a better understanding of the classification of these diseases, which has then led to a better understanding of how these treat diseases should all be treated differently. Next slide, please. Um, you can see here a couple of slides of epidemiology. Um, soft tissue sarcomas affect all ages. In fact, it's the uh, highest burden of cancer related disease in uh, adolescents and young adults. Uh, next slide, please. And here is the latest WHO classification. You can see these are all different subtypes of soft tissue sarcoma. Next slide. Overall, however, it's important to note that patients with soft tissue sarcoma, if diagnosed early, do well, but if diagnosed late, do poorly. We have no really good effective systemic therapies for patients with the vast majority of subtypes of soft tissue sarcoma. So it is really important to try and avoid patients with sarcoma developing advanced disease because advanced disease, unlike in breast cancer, melanoma, and many other cancers in sarcoma is a very big problem. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So why is it important for GPs to know about sarcoma? Well, most of you will probably see only a couple of patients, maybe even a couple of patients during your career, but for those patients, having an early diagnosis um, will significantly improve their outcome. Most patients who I see with sarcoma have presented to many doctors for many months prior to their diagnosis with what are often common complaints. And that's not a criticism. That's just the reality of the patient's experience because people often don't think about uncommon diagnoses, which is completely understandable and reasonable. So what I'm going to try and point out to you are some of the red flags and things to, that might ring an alarm bell. Next slide, please. So my patient has a lump. Here are the red flags. Next slide. The first one is that this mass is increasing in size. Most benign lesions don't grow, or if they grow, they grow very slowly. If someone comes to you with a lump that looks benign, and then comes back to you with the same lump and it's bigger, that is a red flag. A lump that's more than five centimeters in size. So five centimeters, I like to use the analogy of a golf ball. Patients with lipomas or common soft tissue lumps, generally these are small. Once they get to a size bigger than five centimeters, I think it, they should not be dismissed as necessarily benign without any investigation next slide next one so if they're deep so subcutaneous and dermal lesions are more commonly benign but deep that is deep to the deep fascia in a muscle those are much more commonly malignant and malignancy needs to be excluded for any deep lying soft tissue mass next slide if they're firmer than the surrounding tissue. So the most common soft tissue lump is a lipoma. Lipomas are soft, but if the patient comes in with a lump and it looks benign, but it feels hard, 
that should raise suspicion. Next one. And patients with potential risk factors. They've had previous radiotherapy, and David showed you that uh, angiosarcoma in the breast, that's almost certainly someone who's had previous breast radiotherapy. About one in a thousand patients who have radiotherapy for breast cancer will develop radiotherapy induced angiosarcoma. If they've got chronic lymphedema, if they've got some sort of inherited uh, predisposition syndrome, someone with a soft tissue mass in that context, that should raise an alarm bells. And finally, if it's painless. So generally, um, infections and things cause pain, but painless masses, uh, particularly painless masses that have one of those other uh, alarm, uh, red flags should uh, raise concerns. Next slide. No, that's gone backwards. We just did that. Oh. Great. So here is an example. This looks like a pretty innocuous uh, lesion in the pretibial skin of a uh, woman in her 50s, but it's enlarging, it's painless, it's firm, and it's fixed to the underlying fascia. Next slide. Red, red, red. Um, this is a myxofibrosarcoma. Uh, next slide. This is a guy, this guy has a big lump that you can see poking out from his right flank that is soft. The skin overlying it is normal, but it's been growing. It's more than five centimeters. It's painless. Red flags. This guy has an atypical lipomatous tumor or well-differentiated liposarcoma. Next slide. This is a Funny photo, but if you imagine this is a patient lying on their side with their head to the left. So this is uh, in the, uh, sorry, with their head to the right. It's in the left buttock. Um, it's more than five centimeters in size. It's painless. It's been growing. It's an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. That's a high grade sarcoma arising in the gluteus maximus. Next slide. So when do I refer a patient? Next slide. So the key here is to refer early. Most people who treat sarcoma will not mind being referred a patient who doesn't have sarcoma. It's not like breast cancer that there's gazillions of patients and many more patients with benign breast lumps and there's no room in the clinic. If you've got patients, especially young patients with suspicious lesions, we'd rather work them up, reassure them and send them home than see a patient with a missed diagnosis. So it's best if you're suspicious to get an ultrasound. The ultrasound will usually in itself raise some red flags. So have a low threshold for ordering ultrasound in these red flags. And if the ultrasound raises any concerns, then send the patient off to a specialist sarcoma unit because the workup is best done by the person who's likely to treat the problem. Next slide. My, the take home message from my talk, go back please. The take home message for this talk is that the key to optimal management of patients with sarcoma is over referral. We want patients, we want more patients who don't have sarcoma than patients who do have sarcoma to make sure that some of the sarcoma patients are not missed. Uh, and why is that? That's to avoid this, which is what we call the whoops procedure. Next slide. This is the second mantra of my talk. There is no role for an excision biopsy of a lesion suspected to be soft tissue sarcoma. Taking it out to find out what it is was something that was done routinely in the past. This does not lead to optimal outcomes. And why? Because oh, if you do an inadvertent excision, firstly, the rates of local control, as in of preventing the patient's cancer from recurring and therefore of not having to have an amputation are lower. The time to recurrence and metastasis in someone who's had a whoops procedure are shorter. There are more patients with wound complications. There are more patients who need complex closures and complex reconstructions because most of the time when a patient has an inadvertent excision, they end up having an excision with positive margins. And therefore, when they have their definitive surgery, 
the definitive surgery often ends up being much bigger than it needed to be had the definitive surgery been the first operation. Next slide, please. Yeah, good. So the principles, and I'm just going to keep this brief because you don't need to treat the sarcomas, but essentially what we do is we get a high quality imaging scan, usually an MRI. We plan a biopsy, which is usually image guided, either with ultrasound or CT scan. And the key here is to have it done at the expert center. So ideally at Peter Mac, that way the biopsy is done by someone who does the biopsies all the time. And importantly, lands on the desk of a pathologist who sees all of those hundred different sarcomas so that they can do all of the fancy and expensive tests to give us the right diagnosis. Because without the right diagnosis, you cannot do the right treatment. The accurate diagnosis is key to optimal patient management. Next slide, please. So this lesion that I showed you before, the myxofibrosarcoma, next slide. You can see that the what you can see there on the photo is really just the tip of the iceberg. And you can see the enhancement there on the MRI extending medially around the tibia, around about a third of the circumference of the leg. There's no way that an excision biopsy would have given you anything but the tip of the iceberg in that lesion. Next slide. This is a retroperitoneal liposarcoma. It's a huge uh, tumor with fatty and solid components. You can see there the PET scan. And the next slide will show you why having a workup done in a specialist center is important because this is a study that we did correlating the biopsy diagnosis and the definitive diagnosis. And in patients who had a PET scan done preoperatively and had molecular pathology done on the biopsy, we showed almost perfect agreement with the final pathology. In patients who did not have optimal workup, there was only moderate agreement between the biopsy and the final pathology. So you really want to have the biopsy and the done in the same place where the workup is being done. And finally, once the diagnosis of sarcoma is confirmed, firstly, we make sure that patients don't have metastatic disease with cross-sectional imaging, CT scans, maybe with PET scan. They get discussed in our MDM, uh, where we have a robust discussion about optimal patient management. And this, in patients who do not have metastatic disease, many patients will receive preoperative radiotherapy, some patients will receive preoperative chemotherapy. Some patients will go straight to surgery. That will all be based on the exact histology, um, which drives the patient's decision-making. Uh, next slide. Uh, the staging, we don't need to talk about this, but it's based on size, depth, and grade. Um, and the management from a surgical perspective is to do an on-block resection with a margin of normal tissue. Next slide. And you can see here, next, click again. You can see here two enhancing lesions that look kind of similar, but actually histologically, they're completely different. And that's going to tell us how we need to manage the patient. The patient on the left with a grade three D differentiated liposarcoma um, has an infiltrating lesion. Although it's abutting the muscle, it's very likely to be invading the muscle. It's also very likely to develop distant metastatic disease. So this patient needs aggressive treatment in some younger patients might be considered for preoperative chemotherapy and likely to have preoperative radiotherapy. The one on the right, the DFSP, that's a dermal sarcoma, even though it's under the skin, it's, it's a relatively low grade lesion, has a low risk of distant metastatic disease. This patient's gonna go straight to surgery and have a very good prognosis. Uh, next slide. And so the final slide is basically to say that if we get the diagnosis right and we get the planning right, we do big operations with good outcomes uh, at the first time. Next slide. So sarcoma is a rare group of cancers. Early diagnosis is critical. And any lump that's growing, that's more than five centimeters, that's deep to the deep fascia and painless should be considered malignant. Next slide. What I want you to take home from this is the thought that this lump could be malignant, not this lump is probably not malignant. 
And that mindset, I think, will help to make sure that less patients' diagnoses are missed. Thank you. Hey. Thanks very much, David. That's great. Now, Alexis, back to you, I think, for a yes, little help yes, pathway. Yes, thank you. Yeah. What do you want to do with questions first? Uh, no, I'll just do heart health pathways quickly. Just um, on behalf of Northwest Melbourne PHN, I'd just like to talk about health pathways very quickly. Um, health pathways is an online resource written by GPs for GP teams. Um, it provides clinicians with locally agreed information to make the best decisions at the point of care. Um, each pathway is written for use during a consultation with the intent of providing clear and concise guidance for assessing and managing patients with a particular symptom or condition. Next slide, please. The process of developing content for Health Pathways is a collaborative effort between our local GPs, specialists, allied health providers and other subject matter experts. Health Pathways aims to enhance clinical knowledge and promote best practice. It aims to reduce variation in care, improve the quality of pre-referral workup and to reduce delays with referrals. Um, next slide, please. Um, as you can see, there are relevant pathways to what we've been speaking about tonight. Next slide, please. Breast symptoms, next slide. Click through these, breast cancer screening. And also, next slide, next slide, um, next slide. <laughs> All the pathways, next slide. Um, and also how to manage established breast cancer. Um, really, the content covered by Health Pathways includes information on all facets of clinical care. Um, and to access Health Pathways, you just need to go to this website address here on the slide. And um, it's available to GP teams and other clinicians in the East Melbourne PHN and Northwest Melbourne PHN catchments. And if you don't have access yet, you can click on register, which brings up an online form and Northwest Melbourne PHN will also organise automatic login for you so you can access Health Pathways without a username and password. And just email the team on the email address here if you want to know more information. And I might launch straight into questions as we're quite short of time. So one of the first questions we've got here, I may as well do them, Caroline, I guess. Yeah. Can MRI for breast be or be referred by a GP under MBS? Thanks. Short answer is yes, um, but there is um, a high false positive rate, especially with the first ever um, breast MRI, we quote patients anything between 10 to 20 percent. Um, so often they are ordered by specialists. Um, certainly we would be doing breast MRIs routinely for high risk patients. For women who are at a moderately increased risk of breast cancer, often we start with annual mammograms and then, then depending on their breast density, think about adding an MRI in that, in that situation. Um, but yes, they can be ordered by GPs in short. And um, simple cyst that is palpable, does that always need FNA? Uh, great question. The short answer is no. The only reason to aspirate a cyst that's simple is if it's symptomatic for the patient. So if it's painful or very visible, then often patients will want it aspirated. But there is no medical reason to aspirate uh, a simple cyst. Okay. And then another question any risk factors for sarcoma um, and where can we find a sarcoma surgeon? Uh, so the risk factors for sarcoma um, include previous radiation, chronic lymphedema, mm. genetic predisposition, but most patients with sarcoma do not have risk factors. Most patients will present with a, uh, a new lump um, in the absence of any uh, risk factors or often an incidental finding. They've had a scan, the scan's shown a lump that they weren't even aware of. Um, and um, the refer so Peter Mack is the referral center for 
sarcoma in the state of Victoria. So the, the way, if you've got someone who you think is has sarcoma, then just refer uh, to the sarcoma service of Peter Mac, where the patient will be triaged. Often we'll work the patient up before we see them so they only have to come once, particularly the ones where the likely outcome is benign. Um, so they'll come only once the biopsy and everything's already been done. Um, and uh, in answer to the question that, that was below around whether or not patients should go first to their general surgery outpatient department, um, if you as the primary care doctor have a patient who's got some of those red flags and you are worried, or they've, and particularly if they've got an ultrasound and the ultrasound also raises some suspicion, there's no reason to go to your local hospital outpa surgical outpatient because they're hopefully just going to send the patient to us. So happy to see the patient on a referral from a GP. Okay. Just three more questions. When should we test CA125 for breast cancer? We do normally don't use um, uh, tumour markers for screening at, at all for breast cancer. Um, it's difficult to interpret and certainly CA125 is not routine. And what is the role of contrast enhanced mammography in breast screening? Um, Excellent question. I'll take that one. Uh, <laughs> So I should just declare that I'm a state clinical director of Breast Screen Victoria. And so the role of contrast enhanced mammography and screening is a hot topic. I think the short answer is that there's no doubt for women with very dense breasts, contrast enhanced mammography is a benefit. It will identify more stuff in, a, in an area where we know mammography is not perfect. I would highlight that as a screening tool, mammography still trumps uh, ultrasound uh, and there's no randomized controlled trials about the use of contrast enhanced mammography in screening. That said, I think as the screening program moves to a more stratified approach, you'll find that women with dense breasts or who are particularly high risk might be offered contrast uh, mammogram, which is, uh, I've heard it described as a halfway house between a standard mammogram and an MRI. That's not true. It is, it is a more detailed uh, mammogram which has better sensitivity and specificity uh, than, a, than a plain one. Sorry about that. It is 8 o'clock. Um, so I think you'll, you will see it being used more often. There are some proponents that it's a must-have in everyone. I think there's plenty of evidence to come before we say that's the case. But certainly in, in a targeted group, that's where we think it will have a role. And just... One last question. Thank you, David. Um, what percentage of Australian women have ER positive breast cancer? When considering breast cancer medical prophylaxis, how do we select patients without knowing this state and just based on screening alone? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so the majority of um, Australian women will have ER positive breast cancer with quite approximately 80%. Um, so, and there's no, um, you know, certainly um, patients who have certain germline mutations such as BRCA1 are more prone to getting um, hormone receptor negative breast cancers. Um, but you are right, there's no um, absolute kind of phenotype that we can say this person's going to get hormone receptor positive or hormone receptor negative breast cancer. Um, but certainly the ER positive breast cancers are the majority. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you for answering those questions. Uh, as it's already past eight, I think we'll have to leave it there. But thank you all for some wonderful presentations and thank you for everyone for attending. And I think Northwest Melbourne PHN is going to send out some evaluations and it would be great if you could fill those in. And um, thank you very much and look forward to the next um, webinar that we have in the series in the new year. So we will email you details of that if you've registered here tonight and let us have access to your email address. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, Caroline.